Welcome to the 360 Teaching and Learning Podcast, an all-round look at student-centered education. I'm Adrian Pumphrey, and in this episode, Laura Gellin and I talk with Park Tudor's incoming head of school, Chris Front. We get to know Mr. Front and discuss his hopes and priorities for the coming year. Enjoy the episode. Well, Mr. Chris Front, thank you uh, so much for joining us on the show, and welcome to Park Tudor School. Thank you for having me. I am super excited about joining you guys. I can't believe it's only a few months away. I know time flies. Um, just to start off with 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 a selfish question, because I'm a sixth grade teacher, and uh, we traditionally go to uh, St. Louis for our class trip. Do you have any suggestions for us or favorite things in St. Louis? Yeah, um, I to me, I think one of my favorite things is Forest Park which is, uh, I think it's over five square miles public park downtown. And there's trails and, um, you know, there's a a reflection pond. Um, But it also has the museum and the zoo, which are two of my favorite things, the art museum, I should say. Um, And I I, I love those things. I think going to see the arch is really exciting. I personally went up once and I will never go up again. <laughs> I'm a little claustrophobic and the, the elevators are a little small, but it's truly a pretty exciting sight to see. No, it, that's only surpassed by the experience of going up the arch uh, with uh, a lot of loud sixth grade kids. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's something, it's quite something. Uh, but yeah. thank you. that's great. That's great. I'll yeah. pass that along to the team. More seriously, um, you've uh, got big things coming up. You uh, are joining the the school as head of school in the summer, and we are very excited to to have you. How are you feeling about the this new stage in Indianapolis? I'm really excited. Um, it's been a little weird because I've known about this since September and kind of being in this holding pattern, uh, being in limbo. But um, you know, I visited once, I'm coming back actually next week, um, and hopefully a couple times in the spring. And that's uh, just kind of increased my excitement about the opportunity. I'm, I'm excited about the challenges. I'm really excited about meeting more of the people and getting to know people. And I've been following uh, Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> and um, that's been super fun. I saw that video of the buzzer beater from, I guess it was last yeah. week. And I'm assuming that happens at every game. So, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in with high expectations. Yeah. I, think that's I mean, yeah. But the theater program really excites me, the arts and some of the speakers you've brought. I mean, it's everything is just super exciting. And so, right now, you are, are you the, you're the associate head of school at your school? Is that right? Assistant head of school for academic affairs, which is a mouthful, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then, Moving into the position of head of school, what are you, what are you most specifically looking forward to of what what this new position affords? You know, I as I was uh, going through the process, I I had some things I really wanted uh, for my future future school, um, and I wanted a place where the kids seemed you know kind and curious and eager to take advantage uh, advantage of the the things the school offered and it it seemed to me everything i learned about it the park tutor was that kind of place and no less importantly um, a faculty that was really dedicated to the students um, talking with the students during my interview um, it, just the way they talked so glowingly about the relationships with their faculty and what they learned from the faculty I feel really blessed to have been at a school like that for, for the last 20 years. And as I moved on and I wanted to try uh, move on and have more challenges, I wanted to make sure I landed at a place like that. And so that um, more than anything, I think is, is super exciting for me. And um, the more I learn, the deeper I dig, the more kind of, I hate to use the word giddy because it sounds like my grandmother would say it, but I am feeling a little <laughs> giddy about it. <laughs> well, it sounds like, um, I think you've got you've got a pretty good a pretty good read on I think what we all value um in terms of those personal relationships. It's certainly what keeps um teachers here and and wanting to work here um and certainly what what we appreciate about being here. Following on from that, uh in asking this question, I'm I'm going to try and sound not too much like a political pundit asking a, a, a new president <laughs> what their 
priorities are for the first hundred days. But um, as you look towards the new year, you know, it's a brand new school, brand new city. Um, what what do you think your um, priorities are uh, moving into this new role? I I think what I what I most want to do um, from the start and what's most important to me is really doing a lot of listening and learning. Um, I've learned a lot about the school, but I know in some ways it feels like so little. And I want to talk to the experts and the people that love the place and figure out you know, what are the things they cherish most? And then what are their aspirations and hopes for where Park Tudor can move? Mm-hmm. And it's it's such an exceptional school. It's got such an exceptional reputation. And I want to kind of understand the, the depth of that and where that comes from and, and how people think uh, you guys have been able to achieve that. And also think about, you know, what's the next thing that people are excited to do? Where, where do they want to grow? Where do they want to build? But as a cultural historian, I, I understand the value of how culture is and, and change and, and, and the strength of an institution really has to be connected to its history and, and what people value. And you can't really be successful unless you understand that foundation. And that's something I'm going to have to spend a lot of time doing. And I'm really excited to start having meetings with faculty um, I started meeting with administrators, um, alumni, and of course, students, mm-hmm. because they are the experts. So I, I love that you're bringing in um, the perspective of the cultural historian. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think that's actually a really great way to to approach um, what you're about to head into. I think that makes a lot of sense. It also makes me wonder, will you miss being in the classroom? I will. Um it's, it's funny. I, I still teach a class and um, my seniors are kind of enjoying the fact that they're the last ones here and they remind me about once a week. <laughs> and um, it, and actually last week, one of them says, are you going to miss teaching? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to really, really miss that. And, you know, I've been teaching history over 20 years and every year that passes, the content matters a little less to me and the relationships with the students you know, I, the lesson I did today, I've done 21 times um, in some way, shape or form. And really it's different 21 times. And that's because who's in the room. And I, I love that. Um, I love those connections. My teaching, I think about is kind of my recess in the middle of the day, like where I just get to have fun and talk about cool things. So I am. And, um, you know, maybe one day I can get back in the classroom. I know previous heads have done that that's not going to happen my first year for some obvious reasons, but it is something, um, even if just to, to guest teach a class here and there would be super fun for me. Just out of interest, uh, what is your favorite period of history to, uh, to teach and think about? So I was trained uh, as a colonial historian, American colonial history. Um, but when I came to Burroughs, um, the person who taught the post World War World War II class, um, he actually quit like the day before my interview and told me on the way to the airport that he wouldn't be there. And so I picked up his class uh, because the kids had already registered. And that's actually become my favorite thing: the the post World War II era. I just think there's so many exciting things. My favorite thing is teaching about the civil rights movement. Um, it's really inspirational. There's a tragic sense, but it's also I just love teaching teenagers about things that teenagers did to change the world in such a remarkable way and what really was a really short period of time. So that is probably my favorite thing. There's certain classes I've taught over the years that I've also really loved. I used to teach a class um, on how the development of Chicago transformed the ecosystem of the whole Midwest. Mm -hmm. And that's probably my favorite class I ever taught. I only get to do it once a year, but I I truly love that. the wrong period so i haven't gotten to do it in about 16 years but that's those those are two of the things i really love a lot well i can i can promise you a a guest speaker slot (laughs) in my civil rights rhetoric unit um if you'd like to get some historical background (laughs) i would love that that's awesome and i wonder i wonder this may link to that that part of history or it, it, it may not but uh there are many successful models of leadership and, and styles of leadership. I, I wondered if you could give us a little bit of insight into, into your style of leadership and uh, and what that will bring to the school. 
Yeah. I don't want to in any way assume any relationship between my style of leadership and the leaders of the civil rights movement. No. Um, <laughs> I, I hold them in much too high esteem. And but, you know, as I think about my leadership style, the word that always comes to mind is relational. I don't like working in isolation. I don't like making decisions in isolation, even though I know there's going to, well, there there are now and there will be in the future times where I have to make decisions that not everyone's going to love. Um, that's just kind of the nature of it. But I really think what matters most is connecting with the people you work with and building trust and getting to know them and really getting to know what they value and where they're coming from. Um, it, it really came to light for me during COVID um, because it really brought out the best and worst of everyone, myself included. I'm sure you guys felt that way too. And it, but it really forced us to think about why are people feeling the way they're doing and why are they needing what they're doing and having those one-on-one -on -one meetings with people that were scared or people that were upset, um, people that were frustrated and, and seeing where that was coming from and, and helping us move together towards something that would work as best as it could in that situation really hammered home for me how important that was. And the trust piece is so important too, because I, I'm sure this happened at Park Tudor as well, that people were suspicious of people's motives and said, you're doing this because of this or that. And you got to talk those things out and really kind of sit down face to face. I, I had one teacher who came in my office. This is someone I've been great friends with for years. And she said, if you bring the kids back, someone's going to die. And she said it with all sincerity and she panic stricken and we sat and we talked for like an hour and a half and I didn't convince her of anything. And we kept having those discussions over and over again. And she never felt fully safe and it was hard, but in the end, she's like, well, I, I trust you to make the decision. And I think that's really the core of things. I don't see myself as having all the answers. I think that's hubris. Um, but I do pride myself in being able to bring out the best in people and really bringing people to, to kind of not only come up with the best paths forward, but also to get excited about it and really feel good about it. Um, I love the sound of that. And I, I just, I, if I may follow up to that, in what different <laughs> ways do you build trust with, um, with colleagues and, um, and, and how do you help people sort of build trust in general as an organization? It's hard. And, some of it, I just kind of intuit my way through. I, I think the most important thing is spending time with people and listening and really, really trying to understand what they're saying as opposed to just listening for the sake of listening and, and establishing those relationships in the times where things aren't challenging, because when the challenging time comes, then you really have that core basis. And I, I've been in this community now 20, almost 21 years and um, we, like Park Tutor, have faculty that stay forever. So there's many people that have been here. I'm still not in the top quarter of people <laughs> at uh, quarter of tenure at Burroughs. I haven't made it up to that that level, which is kind of astounding. But you, over time, you just you get to know those people, and that's that's what helps you work with them. What's exciting to me is there's certain people I know how they're going to respond, just as they know how I'm going to respond, and we almost don't have to talk anymore. And I'm really looking forward to trying to figure those things out and and helping people understand me. So moving into um, kind of more about you, um, what do you what do you like to do outside of work? Um, I love spending time with my sons. I have a um, sixteen year old and an eighteen year old, and there's a lot of streaming of TV <laughs> shows and binge watching together. Um, I also. I swim four or five times a week and uh, I love doing that and it keeps me sane and it keeps me healthy. Um, I'm kind of a podcast junkie. I actually listen to podcasts when I swim and um, that's kind of a guilty. Well, some of them are guilty pleasure. Some of them are actually uh, educational. Lately, it's been more on the guilty pleasure side. Um, and you have any recommendations for us? Yes. I do. I love the podcast Smartless, which is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's Will Arnett, um, Sean Hayes, and Jason Bateman, who started the podcast during COVID because they were three good friends and they never got to see each other. And it's really, um, it's part interview and it's part three infantile men mocking each other. Um, 
and it got me through COVID because they would just make me laugh um, the way they kind of playfully beat up in each other. But they have really great guests. I just finished an episode with Bono, who's just awesome. It's- um, I love the podcast Heavyweight, um, which people should check out. It's um, this guy, Jonathan Goldman, who's been a contributor to This American Life over the years. And he helps people go back and resolve like a crisis from their past, but he does it in a really um, unassuming kind of funny way. And, um, and none of them are coming to mind, but it's really cool. Like, Oh, I, this girl I was in love with in high school and I said something stupid and then we never talked again. And I really regret that moment and he'll like reconnect them. And uh, it's, it's super, super good. And uh, the memory palace, which is they're like three to five minute um, stories. And they're um, these historical stories you've never heard but are super interesting about famous people you've never heard or sometimes just really ordinary people. And I love those. And they're just, they're almost poetic the way they're written. Those are the ones that come to mind right now. That sounds great. Oh, and I also love the New York times crossword puzzle. I do that every Sunday. That's, you know, my sons know not to bother me when I'm doing that. (laughs) Nice. And then uh, what are you reading right now? Um, I, let's see, I just finished Cormac McCarthy's most recent book called The Passenger. I'm a huge Cormac McCarthy fan, um, which it turns out Sarah South, uh, who will be, who will be my assistant, is also a huge fan. So we've already bonded on that. Um, and I'm kind of trying to figure out what I want to read next. I also recently read The Underground Railroad um, uh, by Colson Colson Whitehead, um, and both those books were kind of dark and depressing so i'm looking for something a little more upbeat like maybe a detective novel or or something funny Um, but both are just beautiful and but also kind of bleak (laughs) as cormac mccarthy always is but (laughs) (laughs) well we'll definitely have to uh, check out some of those podcasts i do have um, a significant number of questions about how you listen to podcasts in the pool Uh, but we'll save those for another time (laughs) Um, uh, right now we have a, a, a couple of minutes left for a, uh, quick rapid fire round, uh, just to get to know you very quickly in a short space of time. So, uh, if you're ready, then we'll get going. Um, let's go. Okay. I'll just warn you. I, I have a really hard time with, uh, yes or no questions or, uh, <laughs> this or that. I, I tend to live in the gray. So just be forewarned. <laughs> okay. That's allowed. That's allowed, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, so, <laughs> uh cardinals or blues so this is one uh i don't really follow professional athletics very much um Mm -hmm. but i'm gonna say the cubs mainly because i think now i can really upset the st louis people since i'm on my way out (laughs) um and um i I grew up in chicago my mother's a huge cubs fan so okay okay uh, I'm glad we don't have uh, an MLB team here in India. Yes. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, morning or evening? Evening. I need my coffee in the morning, and uh, then I get a little better in the morning, and then I improve with age. <laughs> <laughs> read or listen? Definitely read, except for podcasts. But when, I, when I'm doing books, I have to see the word on the page. Pen or computer? I'd say my iPad. Um, I, I love using my Apple Pencil and taking notes on there and everything else uh, along those lines. Though I really, if I, I love a really good high quality pen or a really great mechanical pencil. I'm kind of old school that way. But uh, the students here used to say that my iPad was my fifth limb for what that's worth. <laughs> um, Beatles or U2? U2. Uh, cake or pie? <laughs> do I have to choose? Yeah, um, can absolutely. I say both? <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I had to choose, I would say pie, a really good fruit pie. Like a uh, any pie. particular kind of pie? Uh, like blackberries or cherry pie in Michigan in the summer is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's sugar cream pie is a big deal in Indiana, I hear. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if you've tried that. Let me know the best place to to get it, and I will try that out when I'm there. <laughs> um, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. I uh, I never really got into Star Trek for what it's worth, but that's fair. 
Uh, I'll have some Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> um, tie or bow tie? Tie. I don't know how to do a bow tie. I, and I don't think I can pull it off. Um, that could be a new thing for Indianapolis, maybe. Uh, you know? Maybe if someone's going to have to teach me how to do it, though. So. <laughs> Okay, last one. Uh, New York City or Aspen, Colorado? New York City. I went to college there and graduate school there. I love New York City. Don't get back enough. Fantastic. Well, Mr. Chris Front, um, thank you so much for talking with us today. We are really excited to have you with us in the summer. And uh, good luck with the rest of your semester. Well, thank you both so much. It's been great talking to you. And I can't wait to see you in person very, very soon. We're looking forward to it. The 360 Teaching and Learning Podcast is produced by Park Tudor School. To listen to previous episodes, head to 360podcast.org or subscribe by searching for 360 Teaching and Learning wherever you get your podcasts.